glad you could join us for our church at home today. I want to wish you a happy Palm Sunday, and we are really glad that you're here. This is the start of Holy Week, and we're excited about that. It's a great time of year for most people, but it's a very different season for all of us, I think. You know, if you're a Christ follower or if you're just kind of curious about what this is all about, um, it's very different for all of us, and, uh, but yet actually very timeless. This is the time of year that we have conversations about that of the death of Christ and, and about that of also the, de- the resurrection. Those, those conversations can be uh, very thought-provoking, and I think that they can also at times become very mystifying within our lives, and they're wrapped in this beauty. It's all in the very same package of, that, of, of the resurrection. How powerful and how inexhaustible is of the love of one that would die for many. And that's what we celebrate this time of year during Holy Week. For maybe you're thinking, well, Mark, how does this apply to me in my life? You know, how does this, how does this shake out for me? Specifically, how does these events that we're going to talk about for this Sunday and next Sunday, how do they help me navigate my relationships? How do they help me through this COVID-19 virus and the quarantine that I'm experiencing, how do they help me be a better parent or a better husband or a better wife or how does it help me to be a better friend or a better employee within my life? And as we look at that, I think those are the questions that we ask ourselves. And I think it's very easy for us to begin to frame these events historically or ecclesiastically as, as how it deals with the, the, the essence of history or just that of the church and religion. It's very easy for us to go there during this time of year, I think. This thought of one dying for many and and Jesus' death at the very hands of both that of the Jews and the Gentiles, that he is simply forsaken by the totality of all of his creation. This conversation today has to be about those events, and they have to be very personal in our lives. They have to be very upfront with you and I. It's not something that we can relegate to just a story that happened thousands of years before, but it's something that speaks to our own hearts today. This conversation has to simply weigh into our daily moments of life. It's an extremely personal conversation that we need to have about this narrative this morning. In the middle of the carnage of the crucifixion, what you and I discover for our lives is we discover hope. Hope that cannot be duplicated in anything else in in this world. It's not a hope that's propped up by unfulfilled promises, or it's not a hope that is propped up by possibilities, but it's founded in the immutable fact that Christ gave himself without coercion, that nobody pushed him. He was driven by love for you and I. It's his heart driven by love to die for those of us that just can't get it right in life. So when the Father looks upon us, He doesn't see us in the imperfection of our humanity, but He sees us very much in that of the perfection of His Son. That's the work of the cross and the crucifixion for you and I today. And it makes it extremely personal because it doesn't eliminate anybody in this life. It covers all of us in that way that he loves us through the perfection of his son, Christ. But you say, but Mark, I would like to keep this in just the arena of religion. I don't want this to affect my, my life in other areas. I don't want it to affect my job and, and other relationships. I don't want to bring it into that. And can I tell you, that's not possible. It's not possible to do that. It, it's really not. Uh, you may try, but it doesn't work. In our narrative last week and continuing in this week, It's about this character, truly about Christ, yes, but this character by the name of Pilate. And that's exactly what Pilate does. He tries to to keep this in a certain place of his life, and, and you can't do that. Because what Jesus does in the crucifixion, that he steps into the very mess of our lives. And that's exactly what he does in the life of Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. As determined as Pilate was through all the things that we read about in this narrative, he could never prevent God from loving him. And man, people try that all the time. And some of you sitting out there or wherever you are have tried that in your life, and it's absolutely impossible to prevent God from loving you. So it brings us to a text this morning that we're going to read together. And it's in the book of John, and it's chapter 19, 
and verses 1 through 16. Now start reading because it's a great narrative. So grab your Bibles where you are at home or your device and follow along in the reading. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. We know it's one of two beatings that Jesus got before the crucifixion. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. And Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. And when Pilate heard heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered his headquarters again and again said to Jesus, Where are you from? Pilate desperately searches to get himself out of this predicament and dilemma that he's in. But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you're not speaking to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and to the authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you, have, you would have no authority over me at all unless I have given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And so Pilate heard these words. He brought Jesus out. He sat on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Aramaic, it's called Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And I have to stop for a pause for a point there, because when I read that, boy, this resonated within my heart. It's perhaps one of the most emboldening statements that we find throughout this whole narrative, that they choose between the incarnate Christ, the one that brings hope to both Jew and Gentile. They choose between him and Caesar, who is historically this half-mad tyrant and oppressor of the Jewish people, but yet they choose Caesar. And I thought about this. The very essence of sin is not necessarily the act of sin itself. It's not. But it's, it's simply that of the rejection of Christ within our lives, because Christ dies for all sin. So the last verse, verse 16, says, So he delivered him over to them, to be crucified. And you say, hey, Mark, I just want, I just want to, you know, uh, avoid talking about this whole crucifixion event, and, and I want to talk about maybe some needs in my life today. That's really what is important to me. And, and I, I say, yes, your needs are important. Yes. Some of you are saying, I need less social distancing in my life. And then all the introverts are saying, I need more social distancing in my life, because you're, you're really kind of thriving in this moment of us kind of staying away from another, each other. And, and some of you say, I need more norm, normality within my life is what I really need right now. Is it possible that the greatest need of our life and this great love that Christ has, that one dies for the sin of all, could it be the greatest need of our life and that of Christ dying for the sin of all is the very same thing? That's a great question for us to really consider together today. Could it be? So I ask you this question. What's your greatest need? What is your greatest need? And boy, you could have that discussion in your living room with your family right now, or or maybe you're there watching this with a friend. What's the greatest need of your life? Because the opponents of Jesus, they have needs too. Those that are bringing, those religious leaders that are bringing Jesus to Pilate, their need is this. They want a king. They want a king, but they want a king like King David was of the Old Testament is what they're looking for. And so we all have needs. And so right before their very eyes is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords that we know what Scripture calls him. They need a Savior who brings hope not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And he's right before them, yet they cannot see it. They can't see it. He brings hope to life now, and he brings hope to life that it is to come. It's like, I don't know if you ever had this moment in your life, but it's like 
walking around your house looking for your cell phone while you're talking on your cell phone. And I've had that happen for me before, that I call Reba on my cell phone and say, you know, where's my phone? And I'm calling her on my phone. It's like looking for the TV remote and you've been sitting on it the entire time on the couch or the sofa, that it's right before them. Because you see, there's always this longing in our heart for something more in life. It's our humanity. It's the way that we are wired as humans. And you say, well, Mark, but I have real needs in my life. I'm in a dysfunctional relationship, and, and I don't want to devalue that with you this morning. So that's not the debate. Or maybe you're dealing with a, an addiction within your life, or you're struggling with anger, and those are significant, and I would never minimize those, those things for you. But for a moment, could you just, just consider the thought that those are not your ultimate need? They're not. Those are not the ultimate issues of your life then maybe there's a possibility that those things stem from that ultimate issues of your life. Our greatest need. Well, what is that, Mark? You talk about it. You keep saying it. But what is the greatest need of our life? And that it's this, that we were created to do life with God. That's the greatest need of our life, that you and I were created to do life with God. Yes. And, and so what we do, you know, you say, but Mark, where does that begin? And I, I can tell you, it begins back in the book of Genesis, because if you look way back in the book of Genesis in the beginning, what we realize is that God created man to walk with him in the cool of the evening. And so God would come down in the cool of the evening, and, and man and God would walk together, and they would have this relationship, and God and man did life together. That is what we were created to do. So, you know, when we look at our lives, what do we think is important? Well, what do we think we were created to do or built to do? Well, we think sometimes these are not bad things, right? That we were, we were built for uh, to get an education maybe and discover our career. Maybe that's it. That we find that special person in our life at some point. And I, I'm not saying you have to do that, but maybe some do. You get married, you buy a house, you, you get a dog. And some people, you know, they can't deal with a dog, so they get a cat. And, and so we have five kids and we work for 30 years and at some point we retire and move to Florida and we never wear pants again, but we wear shorts, a t-shirt and flip-flops. And that's what we live for. But what were we built for? It's a huge question for us in our humanity. To do life with God. That's it. But what happens is that sin breaks that relationship. And what this is about, when we're on Talking Palm Sunday and Holy Week, is that Jesus comes and he invades the mess of our life. He invades that broken relationship. It's the cross that reconciles you and I back to God is what it is. It's what we need most, that Jesus makes a way for our lives to do life with him. You see a common thread that we, what we find in Scripture is this, that Jesus really loves doing life with people like you and I. And for some of you, that's a huge surprise, I know. It, it, maybe it's a shock that God really loves doing life with you. And that example is modeled throughout Scripture. It, it is. He loves doing life with people that are broken and flawed. And Scripture proves that. People that are living in dysfunctional relationships, He loves to do life with them. People that make poor decisions in life. Can I share a story with you from also the book of John? It's in chapter 8. I'll read a text in a moment. But let me give you a little background. Jesus comes to the temple early in the morning. People are waiting for him to teach Scripture. And as he arrives, the religious leaders are waiting for him. And what they do is they've been waiting maybe all night because they bring to him a woman who's been caught in adultery. Most likely they've held her captive all evening. And so they bring her to, to him and they throw him at his feet. And, and what they say to, to him is, you know, uh, what are you going to do with this woman who's been caught in sin? Just, that's paraphrasing. And, and there's, no, there, there's nothing about equality here. There's nothing about justice. That's not their heart. We know that. That's not their heart at all. Because there's no man brought to Jesus, and it takes two for adultery. So they only bring her. The heart of the religious leaders has nothing to do with justice or righteousness. It's a test for Jesus. They test Jesus to see how he deals with her in the area of mercy or condemnation. Not judgment, because there's a difference between judgment and condemnation, but about condemnation. And for some, Jesus passes the test with flying colors. For others, he fails miserably. Let me read you the text in John 8 and verse 6. It says, This they said to test him, and they brought 
and that they might have some charge to bring against him. And so Jesus bent down and he wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. You say, Mark, you know, the interesting thing is that there's no one there that is without sin that can throw a stone at her. But the point is, that's not a true statement because there is one that can do that. And once more he bent down and he wrote on the ground, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older one and Jesus, older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And that's the part that really got me because I, I, I guess the Lord began to say to me, that's what we're created to do. That's the moment that God created us for. It's what Adam did with God in the garden is exactly what it is. It's what Jesus is doing at that very moment with Pilate. That Jesus is spending time with his, or Pilate is spending time with his creator, Jesus. It's exactly what's happened. It's what Jesus does to you and I. We were built to do life with him. And so Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Uh, Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord, is her words to Christ. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And we know that this sinning no more is not accomplished by her own, her own will. It will, it's not that at all. But it's a, because this has not always been about process and not perfection, but this is about God's presence in her life, is what this is about. Augustine said concerning the two were left alone, he says this, and, and I quote, it's mercy is left alone with misery. Mercy is left alone with misery. The perfectly imperfect picture of Jesus and Pilate is what this is. That Jesus keeps turning up the mercy. Pilate, you know, what happens with him is he, he is just simmering in the misery of his own life and the need of his own life. Because for the very first time in this narrative, Pilate is exactly where he was created to be for the very first time. And that is that he is communicating with his creator. It's what Jesus does to the entire passion story for you and I. Is exactly what he does. It's we're, re- we're confronted with the reality of his mercy and his grace. It's his directed toward you and I in this purest form of love that he dies for all of those that are his enemies. Wow. That's so contrary to the way that you and I are wired in our humanity. That he dies for those that are his enemies. This woman caught in adultery, she's absolutely guilty. There's no debate about that. We're guilty. There's no debate about that at all. And she refers to Jesus as Lord as she stands before him. So she knows that he has the power to either forgive or to convict and even execute because she calls him Lord so she understands exactly who he is. And she realizes that the one that is left standing before her, is the only one in the crowd that could throw the stone. And Jesus looks at her, and it's not in the Scripture, but I believe he sighs because he feels the the pain of her very heart. And he looks at her, and he says, Neither do I condemn you. You see, she'll never be perfect. There'll never be a perfect moment in her life until she's with Christ. But mercy changes everything about us. That's why Pilate struggles so much with this conversation with Jesus. That's why you struggle so much in your conversations with God at times, in your relationship with Him, because mercy changes. Mercy runs totally contrary to the way that you and I are wired in our humanity. And so He shows her mercy. He shows you and I mercy. And in place of a stone, He bombards her life with grace and mercy. She's unfaithful, yes. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. What I love about Christ and the story of redemption is this, that Jesus is faithful to the unfaithful. That when you are unfaithful, He is always faithful in our lives. That Jesus eliminates the outcast category of humanity. That's how the cross works. And so if all of this is so evident and straightforward, Mark, then then why do I struggle with forgiveness And man, that's a great question. And our last question today, why do we struggle with forgiveness? Because when Pilate 
says that he has the power to release Jesus or to crucify him, Jesus has been silent with Pilate through this conversation. But then Jesus responds to him, and Jesus says to Pilate, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given from above. John tells us that from that very moment, Pilate sought to release Jesus. What were those words that Jesus spoke to him that changes Pilate so dramatically? Because something happens in his heart. Is there a possibility that Pilate realizes that he's not as, as in control of this situation as he really thinks he is? Is that what's going on here? Because Pilate even asked Jesus, where are you from? And Pilate already knows that he's Jesus of Nazareth, so he knows exactly where he's from. I believe what Pilate is saying to him is this, are you from this world, is what he's saying. He's noticing something different about him, and what brings that about is the mercy that Jesus shows to him. So in the midst of the pain of the beating and the humiliation, what does Jesus do? He shows mercy to Pilate. And Pilate must have thought, who is this kind of person or God that controls everything? Even the very way in which he dies. A God that would even die for those that wish death upon him. And so when I place myself next to him, when I, when I stand alone with Christ in, in my life, I'm needing. I, I'm very needy and needing. And what I realize is that's the point, that I realize my need for him. That I realize my need for him. See, the cross is meant to simply stand in contrast to our brokenness. That's what the cross does in my life and your life. It propels us to Christ because he's greater than the brokenness of our lives. That's what it does. We struggle with forgiveness. It's difficult for you and I to, to deal with the thought sometimes that God would forgive us or can God forgive us of the things that we've done. And the pain of the cross helps you and I to understand that God absolutely hates the things that harm us. That's how much he loves us today. And in light of that, in my realization of my need for him, what I understand is this, that the intensity of God's love can cover anything in my life. That there's nothing that God cannot forgive within me. Nothing. The cross stands as proof of that. And we feel like the we feel like the woman brought to Jesus in John chapter 8, and as she's left alone with Christ, we, when we're left alone with him, we realize, man, I'm really broken. I, I realize how broken I am within my life. Where do I even start if I have to make a list? And can I tell you, you don't have to make a list because God already knows about your brokenness. He does. So the cross is this very public picture of the love of Jesus for the broken people like you and I. I think in our climate, it's tough to see good news amongst, uh, uh, in the middle of so much bad news. Here's the good news, that Christ loves you and that he went public with that, with the cross. That's the work of the cross in our lives. You can categorize this as a, just an event in history. You can categorize this as just that of a religious story. But the way that God has worked in our life through great mercy and grace in the cross, that you can never get away from it. Pilate couldn't. The woman that in front of the temple who committed adultery could not. You and I cannot run from this event that we have to do something with the grace and the mercy of Christ within our lives. So for a moment in your homes, with your families, or if you're by yourself, would you take a moment just to bow your heads to cut out all the distractions in your life and pray for a moment. Father, we thank you that your grace and your mercy overcomes any sin of our lives, any failure, any moment, any bad decision. That the cross stands as a public announcement to us and to the world that you love us so much that you would die for us even when we were your enemies. God, we have to deal with that. We have to lay that over our very life this morning and the sin and the struggles of our lives. We have to lay that over our lives and realize that there's nothing that's not covered by your love, your grace, and your mercy. 
So Father, we surrender those things to you today. Father, maybe we verbally even say them to you. We, we surrender them. And God, you've covered them in your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, we invite you into our life today to live in our hearts and our lives. We dedicate our hearts and our lives to you this morning in the light of the cross, which is the public announcement of your love for us. Thank you, Lord. Stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. 